Okay, welcome back. This is a sort of a bonus lecture at the end of the first part of the first half of the course that concerns classical open systems with the small digression on quantum open systems we had for two lectures. The focus was really on classical mechanics of open systems. And we went through many aspects and, and one of the aspects was how to study reactive events. And uh, I decided to give this, uh, this lecture with a, uh, because I was stimulated by the fact that some students have asked me privately um, to tell a little bit about uh, one, uh, one initiative that has been very mediatically exposed recently. You might have heard even on the national news, on both in televisions and and in newspapers that uh, the INFN has put uh, uh, huge computational resources into research aiming to uh, anti-COVID uh, uh, investigations. And uh, this is a research which I was very directly related to uh, using tools that you have seen in this course. So, and, and basically what happens is in order to allow uh, rapid search for possible treatment for COVID, they have gave us uh, access to almost all of the Italian section of supercomputers that normally are used to analyze the data that come from LHC and CERN. Uh, the ones that were far used to discover the he exposed on that the way that news promoted these things. So the reason um, I'm giving this lecture, so the, the if you want the, the the specific reason is that um, there's been quite a lot of noise about this and I think uh, you have to give general audience explanation. I think it's nice to see how uh, uh, this initiative really alludes to concepts that are uh, strongly directly related to what you studied. So you have a sort of way to understand how to do modern research in pharmacology by using statistical mechanics. But I would like to take the advantage to for the protesters uh, situations for enlarging a little bit the discussion to include other methods that were not developed by my group, but that were developed by others to study how you can sort of uh, try to accelerate uh, the problem of uh, sampling conformational spaces. So uh, basically this lecture is about enhanced sampling. So now if you Google enhanced sampling it's really a huge field in statistical mechanics and computational physics, computational chemistry, and thousands of papers every year. And therefore, certainly, it's not something I can go through in one lecture in an exhaustive way. What I can do in one lecture is, first of all, give you an idea of what these methods are and what they are for. Second, tell you a little bit about uh, how you can use path integral to devise enhanced sampling methods, which sort of narrows up onto the specific uh, focus of the present course. And third, tell you how by using enhanced sampling, you can do uh, sort of socially relevant research. In this case, is a research we are doing for the anti-pandemic emergency. So, so you see how fundamental theory and, 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 and applied theory can talk together. And I may I mean to tell you this not so much for giving advertising of what we do, believe it or not, but rather to show you how it is important to foster fundamental research. You know, how really to see enhance the importance of fundamental research in trying to find innovative strategies for applied research. Okay, sounds like a lot of words. Let's be more practical. So normally uh, we have seen that we are, we have considered a problem of a uh, reactant and product separated by barriers, of course. And transition path theory was the theoretical framework to study this. And we came to the conclusion that understanding the problem with the reactant and the barrier 
and some end product separated by some kind of barrier is 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 a difficult problem, and the correct statistical description of this process is transition barrier. What I did not tell you is how to compute the statistical distributions of transition path theory in an efficient way. Because remember, if you try to solve the Langevin equations, you are stuck with the problem of metastability. You are supposing a double well, you go a long time by simulating transitions in a reactant, and all of a sudden, very rarely, you find the correct sequence of events that take you to a product. We estimated this to be exponential in the height of the barrier. Now, when you are multidimensional systems, your barrier can be made of energy or can be made of entropy. We also mentioned that. The typical example of an entropic barrier is one in which you have two sides of the room, a ball moving randomly, maybe in water, so you have brown emotion, if you want or not. And you have a narrow opening. Now, there's no energy barrier in here. It's just entropic. It's very difficult for sneaking in and finding right a hole. Most of the time, you bounce off the wall. So, Hans, so many times you have a problem like this. And I think I remember telling in this course that this is a super relevant problem in many fields of science, but it is a really key central problem in biology. Because nature always works through activated processes, enzymatic catalysis, uh, biomolecular functions, they all involve processes that take an exponentially long time to occur. And the reason is very simple. If, if, if a protein, for instance, must change its shape to regulate some biological function, it does it always and systematically by overcoming a free energy barrier, where free energy combines energy and entropy through the usual formula. Why does it do it this way? Well, it does it this way because by regulating the height of the barrier, nature can very effectively tune how often a reaction takes place. By changing the barrier by factor two, you get an order of magnitude uh, suppression of the rate of transitions. So that means that basically what enzymes do, the enzymes are other molecules, they jump in and modulate the height of the barrier, and effectively switching off or switching on a reaction. So for instance, you get scared, you need to produce uh, adrenaline for being more effective, and the adrenaline production is activated, meaning something jumps in and modulates the barrier, and all of a sudden you get more adrenaline in your body. And due to that, all of a sudden you get more productive, because reactions must occur very fast. Okay, so uh, that's basically every, old. there could be some counterexamples, like in biology there is always some counterexample, but, but most of the time the rule is anything that happens in biology happens through crossing a barrier, which is what it is. question is, if we want to understand these reactions, we are in big trouble if our only tool is the larger one or the Newton's equations of many sorts. Because we have a real event problem. We simulate an exponentially long time in order to see a very short event. Let me give you some numbers. Suppose we are interested in protein folding, so you get a protein expressed by the ribosome. It comes out of the ribosome is a 3D printer that basically prints prints a sequence of amino acids read off from the messenger RNA into a protein and expels it either in the cytoplasm or in the endoplasmic reticulum. This is biology. It depends on the detail of the protein. It depends on where this protein needs to go. We will not, we'll not discuss this. And then spontaneously this protein 
must look and search for its only final confirmation in which it will be biologically active. This is called a native state. Right? We, I think we mentioned this. If we didn't, I do it again. I did it now. Now, this, is, uh, this process, as you can imagine, involves a huge entropy reduction, and it's driven by a loss of a, a, a gain in, in a loss of potential energy. You get to work energetically stable. So as you go from A to B, energy goes down by several tens of kT. But entropy goes down too by a lot. So you have an entropy energy competition as a result of which at the beginning when you make your first contacts, say so you, you contact this and maybe this, you lose a lot of entropy but make very little energy gain. So at the beginning you go up rising in free energy because the entropy and energy comes with opposite sign. When you then start making many, many contacts, then anymore you don't change much the entropy because you're more or less constraining your configurations to be what it is. So any additional contact you make doesn't really make you lose any entropy, but you gain a lot in energy, so you start going down. So as a result, if I were to draw this along a reaction coordinate, remember the concept of reaction coordinate, here's your unfolded state. There's an initial growth which is dictated by the entropy loss, and then there's a very, very steep gain at some point, and the native state is here. And notice that I've driven this to be very much below the unfolded state because biologically, because in physiologic conditions, typically in water, proteins uh, are most stable in the native structure with a biological reactor. So suppose you want to simulate a problem like this, and I'm using protein folding just as one example of prototypical example which there is uh, a barrier to the con. And the problem is, again, you do molecular dynamic simulation, you get stuck here. So how can you do that without getting stuck? Well, there are many algorithms, some of which are directly related to the pathological formalism that we discussed, some of others are not. Let me first tell you a, a, an algorithm that I think is very popular because of its simplicity, and it's called metadynamics. And I'm gonna only uh, tell about it in words rather than in formula. Uh, so now, suppose you you think you can identify a set of slow collective variables that are, remember, our proxy for the uh, kinetic distance uh, coordinates, if you want. Let me call it collective variable 1 through n. Now, I'm going to give the example in one collective variable for sake of drawing. So basically, I call metadynamics the story of the shitting pigeon. So you have a pigeon that walks on your energy landscape and shits. I call pigeons too. And anytime it gives a poo, it leaves a little bit of dirt there. So anytime it walks, he, he toss a coin and decides, yeah, I'm not going to poo, and he leaves some dirt there. I know it's disgusting, but it's a very effective one. You're not going to forget this example. So after a while, it has covered all of this layer, and it starts walking on top of his po on its own poo. And then again, starts shitting again on top of it, and on top of it, down vomit, on top of it. But now, you see, since any time he walks around, he fills up this hole, at some point, he can roll off on this side and start shitting on this side. But, but the, and it, the more he shits, the effective area that the pigeon sees to jump on the other side is reduced. So basically, physically, this corresponds that any time you, you make a molecular dynamic simulation, any time you potential changes by adding a Gaussian as a function of your collective variables that is repulsive. This Gaussian sort of repels you from going over configuration you've been already. It's like the Filo di Arianna in a Gaussian dynamical sense. So by doing this, 
you tend not to visit a game where you've been. That's the key to solve a maze, right? If you're lost in a maze, you don't want to go twice on where you've been already. So that's what metadynamics does. When you see convergence, is when you start seeing diffusive and visiting all of your configurations in an equal manner. Well, at that point, you stop and you reverse this plot, and all of a sudden, you count how many times you've shifted in a point on your parameter space. And this will be your equilibrium distribution as a function of your collective variable. So you have explored the entire population, and you can show that this is actually related to. There's, a, there's an equation that allows you to infer the free energy as a function of your collective variables from the number of Gaussians you have deposited, or how many times you dropped a piece of sheet, if you were the pigeon, in the population space. So you see, by doing this, you explore very fast your configuration space, you're exponentially gaining with respect to uh, with respect to standard elements. What happens? It, you, what is the catch? Uh, the catch is that you need to know all the slow collective variables of your system. If you miss one, you're never going to converge on the fast time scale. You converge on the long time scale of your system. Let me give you an example. And my typical example is, again, my nice uh, two-dimensional system with a Z-shaped potential. Now, suppose that uh, we, we have a system with a barrier like this and a barrier in here. Suppose now that our collective variable is, again, only the X direction. So your, your pigeon, your particle is here, and your pigeon start to shift in this, and that's your cross here. But when you're here, you shift again, and you cross here. But you never have the chance to cross in this direction and continue on the y-axis, unless you wait your right fluctuations that would take you anyway a long time to get. So you don't have a competition again unless you know all of the slow variables in the system. So in general, and these are going back to, uh, to the most general statement, all these enhanced sampling methods allow you to be faster in the sampling of rare events, provided you're ready to pay a price. And the price is to introduce into the calculation some kind of prior knowledge. Let it be the knowledge of collective coordinates. Let it be the knowledge of the target. Uh, we'll see. But you need to pay a price to get a return on something. Now I'm going to tell you other type of calculations that the ones that we do. And first of all, I want to tell you why path integrals are useful in this case. Because if you write a path integral formulation on the lines of an equation, you can choose Xi and Xf to be directly on the two sides of the wells. And I think I mentioned that already. But let me go over it again. You have some kind of a zaga maklop action. And that's the probability of going from Xi and X to Xf in time t. Now, what is this path integral? Uh, why is this path integral better than Langevin equation? Because I can choose this and this to be on, on opposite side of the barrier. And so this formalism already allows me to sample directly reactive pathways uh, rather than uh, having to waste an exponentially long time in sampling the exploration of the reactant until I'm lucky and cross across. So already using path integral, I get a doubly exponential reduction of time. However, all these enhanced sampling methods have their costs anyway. And typically, uh, the, the plain sampling of this path integral by Monte Carlo or method dynamic calculations allow you to uh, to solve some problems, but are insufficient to solve other problems. 
particular, the folding of a protein of biological interest is not accessible by simply sampling path integrals, this is called transition path sampling, or by method dynamics, or by any of the other methods that I was aware of. Uh, in our lab, we did something more, and we developed variational approximations, or mean field type of approximations, to this path integral. And by means of this, you can simulate folding transitions of proteins of any kind. How does it work? Well, typically the idea, if I were to sketch it, is to introduce a force that is unphysical into the dynamics along the direction of the target. So you want to choose a, your guess of reaction coordinate. And so there, there are two ways, essentially, that we develop. In one is a crude variational estimate. And the second is a more sophisticated, self-consistent refinement calculations. And I will not go through both of them. You can read my papers, or I will give a lecture at the end of the class. I just don't want to go too technical. Let me just show you the simplest case. Suppose you add the information, it's a kind of a proxy of reaction coordinate, you think it's a decent reaction coordinate for the problem. Then you add a force that pushes along the reaction coordinate. Of course, if you do that, you are breaking the dynamics. You're breaking the fluctuation dissipation theorem, you break thermodynamics, and your path that you generate will be, in general, wrong and depending on how you choose to push. Now, of course, you might be saying, well, fine, that's the best I can do. Or you could do better and say, okay, suppose I have a reactant and a product and I have a bunch of puffs that I generated that are all wrong because I used the biasing force to push it. Uh, can I say which one is the least wrong? Can I say, out of a zillion of paths that are all partially incorrect because my reaction coordinate maybe is okay, but it's not perfect. Well, you can show that if you do some specific kind of bias dynamics along the perfect direction, that is the committer function, you get exactly the, the distribution of transition path, sample, transition path theory. So you are completely right, but you don't know the committer function beforehand. So you have a proxy of the committer function. Suppose your proxy is not that bad, then your paths are not that wrong. Still, they're wrong. Can I find a variation? I can use them as a variational basis. I can hope to find within my system of wrong path the optimal path. The way you do it is by addressing the question, what is the path in my path that I generated by wrong dynamics, by bias dynamics, which has the largest probability to occur in the absence of any bias. And with the path integral formalism, you can do that quite simply. You start with the probability of a reaction, that is your path integral, with your Gonzaga Mach loop. Then what you do, you add and subtract the term which corresponds to the bias in term. Right, I've done nothing. And now you can massage this formula in such a way that this is the Onzaga Mach loop action for a, uh, this is the Onzaga Mach loop action for your bias dynamics. And of course you're left with e to the negative sp. Now, again, if you multiply and divide by your biased path integral, which is this one, then you're left with the, what is called the reweighting formula that tells you that your unbiased probability is equal to the biased probability times the average of your paths of the difference between the biased and unbiased 
action. Now, if you ask, so this is the averages performed over biased path. Now you may ask, okay, I want to find paths that have a very large probability to occur in the unbiased dynamics. I want to find a path that have the largest probability in the unbiased dynamics. So I take the functional derivative of my unbiased probability with respect to the path. If you act it on the right hand side and you massage the formula, this is something you can find in my paper in 2015 PLL, physical letters, then you come up with the variational principle of a functional that is called a bias functional, which I will, uh, which is basically a time integral of a square model of the strength of a biasing force. And you can show that the path that has the largest probability to occur in the absence of a bias are those with the least value of this function. So you basically are now have set to do a variational calculation, just as you do in quantum mechanics. You shoot many paths and you retain only those that are good in, according to this variational principle. Okay, this is called the bias function of formalism. And of course, I don't ask you to remember it in, your, in this course. It's just an example of how the tools that you've seen in this class are actually useful in this in this enzyme uh, stuff. Now it turns out that the bias functional is 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 extremely powerful in terms of computational performance, and we could see, we could solve problems of any sort uh, using this. Um, and then by doing this, we could simulate folding proteins of any size, and we realized that there was a secret that nature was keeping from any, anybody that protein folding always occurs from a shortly close to the native state, highly structured intermediate. So it's like saying, in order to go to Rome, you always have to stop near Rome at Orte before you get to Rome. And this, we suspected from the very beginning, had a regulatory role. The main, the, the cells want the protein to be in this intermediate because when there are too many of, of them in the intermediate, then the cell recognizes there are too many proteins around and fold it and gets rid of them. So it's a kind of a feedback control mechanism. And then we got the idea of designing a small molecule that can bind to this intermediate state. And if they bind to this intermediate state, they effectively stop the way to roam because the protein cannot complete its folding. It remains unfolded, and then the cell recognizes quality control and destroys this part. So we, we patented this method and call it PPI feed, Pro pharmacological protein inactivator by targeting for the intermediate. We have applied this method, and we were able to find drugs that can treat met cow disease in cells. Really, like, experimentally verifying that it works. Now, this is a brand new biotechnology that is uh, potentially revolutionary, let me say. So, what our, we founded a small company to, to do this pharmacological research. This is not something that academia can do, because we develop a drug takes many millions, and academia doesn't have that money. Uh, but company can get private investors to put money in. But in the presence of a COVID emergency, the company that is called Sibilla decided to work non-for-profit and uh, they are trying to stop one of the receptors uh, called AC2, it's ACE2, which is used by the virus to recognize the cell membrane and penetrate into the cell. By reducing the number of this receptor protein that are membrane protein, we hope to say shut the door to the virus from to the entry cell. So in order to do that, we have been simulating our AC2 protein uh, folding using the method that you can now understand better with the background of this course. And from this, uh, we hope to be able to find soon small molecules that it can stop the AC2 from folding, reducing the number of AC2 
reduces the chances for violence. When you discover a molecule, you keep it for yourself and you patent it and because it's millions worth. In this case, of course, uh, soon after Easter, we will release our results for the community to use. Because if somebody has, has more resources to come to a cure faster, well, we're happy as long as it works. So this is uh, just a small digression, but the idea of using papintrical into stochastic dynamics and the method that we developed to do that come from subnuclear physics. Basically, there are formalism that was in, I was an expert of that formalism coming from quantum chromodynamics. So you see how basic research can foster uh, fallouts in different sides of science. And I want to emphasize, I mean, there are many examples, probably more successful than this, everywhere you look. I was just trying to, you know, illustrate a specific example we were involved with in Trento, uh, which sort of illustrate how all these concepts that we've seen in this half part of the course uh, come together. In the next lecture, I will start with field theory from the scratch. Bye-bye.